Our reading comes from the late, great African-American poet Langston Hughes. Words that seem hauntingly appropriate in a year that stretched, a church year that stretched from Ferguson to Charleston and many places and people in between. At a time when we are debating whether to take down the Confederate flag, Langston Hughes wrote, Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be. Let America be America again, let it be the dream it used to be. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me nor freedom in this homeland of the free. For all the dreams we've dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that almost died today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, African Americans, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Our next hymn is Building a New Way. We're gonna hear this a lot this week, uh, but we're gonna, this is our Motown version. Please rise in body or in spirit. Building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. Feeling stronger every day. We are building a new way. Freedom is our cry without the 
For those who are here remembering loved ones who are lost, I want you to know that we feel the spirit of your beloved in our ministries, in our congregations. We feel it in this place tonight, and, and they are a mighty cloud of witnesses that surround us always. To my colleagues who are retiring, you are the wind beneath our wings. To my colleagues and other religious professionals who are entering new phases in your ministry or new ministries, may we be up to the task that others have handed us to continue to kindle this spiritual flame that is so important to this world we live in. The last time I was privileged to deliver a sermon to the General Assembly was in 2008 on Sunday morning in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Were, were you there? Yeah. All right. It was two years after I had lost my daughter, Sienna, who had died at age three. I remember talking about Sienna and how very raw it still was then. She would be 12 this year if she had lived. When I'm visiting a person from my congregation who's dying, sometimes I'll ask the person, when you die, if it turns out that there really is heaven on the other side of this life, if you see my little girl, Sienna, will you give her a big hug for me and tell her that her mother and brother and I are doing okay and we love her? And I've discovered that it doesn't matter if the person is a humanist, a secular rationalist, a Buddhist, or a theist. There's something in the very humanity of that sincere request from a broken-hearted father, together with the humility of facing our mortality, that allows us to suspend our disbelief. It allows us to let go of our literalism. So we bathe together in the warm tenderness of the deep longing and the love that begs such a request. Whatever that is, that sacred place where people can meet that's beyond belief and that binds us together in our love and our humanity, that's the place I want us to go tonight. See if you can go there with me. We are a covenanted people bound together by a sacred promise. But I'm not sure we've ever really lived into all of what that can mean. Let's say, for instance, I tell you that I speak in tongues. Would you laugh at me and think I'm ridiculous? What if I believe in Jesus Christ as the incarnation of God and I read the Bible as a way of deepening my own understanding of myself and the world? Can I be a member of your church? I mean, would I really feel welcome? What if I think God is real and prayer is powerful and ritual is effective? Would your church embrace me? Would you? Our churches are based on the premise that there's no test of faith or belief, which allows us to have an incredible diversity of believers and non-believers at the table. Yet I've seen the reactions some people get when they share certain beliefs in our congregations. This was brought home to me in 2008 when my church welcomed Bishop Carlton Pearson. He's a black Pentecostal minister who led a megachurch in Tulsa for 25 years who's become a very close friend. And he and his family and many of his former congregation joined All Souls in Tulsa. At first, I thought I was going to lose my mind because I was so excited. And then I thought I was going to lose my ministry because of all the controversy it stirred up. 
It was well worth every challenge and risk because so much good has come from it. Three months after this all happened, I was in my office at church one day, and a longtime white member of the congregation came to see me. He's a diehard humanist. He's a successful lawyer. He's about 60 years old. He said, Marlon, I want to tell you something that I've never told anyone in this church. You know I grew up Pentecostal, but you don't know that I still speak in tongues. I tried not to look too surprised. But I was shocked. How often, I asked. Probably. <laughs> probably about once or twice a week, he said. He described it as a kind of meditation that allows his mind, his overactive mind, to rest. Once I was over my initial disbelief and had checked my own prejudices, I was struck as I realized that this is a central part of his spiritual life, and he has spent 30 years in our congregation and has never felt that he could tell anyone without being judged negatively or made to feel like he's an outsider. I realized it was a pretty serious condemnation of me and my community that he felt that he had to keep his truth and his spirituality in the closet in order to feel welcome in our church. Do you ever wonder how many people are hiding themselves and their spirituality within our congregations? I don't think we'll ever grow our churches, I mean significantly, if there are places where people have to be spiritually closeted. It really goes against everything we say we're about. It's like doublespeak or Fox News. <laughs> you know, if we say we're all about freedom of belief, but then we have an unspoken culture that keeps certain people in spiritual silos. I'll come back to that. Because there's something else I find people in our churches often withhold from one another. I hope it's okay that I'm starting this message with a little critique before I turn toward the incredible promise I see in this living tradition of ours. I notice a lot of people coming into our churches hiding their deepest fears and longings. Sometimes it seems like we can act like we don't have any existential fears or powerful longings, even destructive longings sometimes. I think if we're honest, many of us are scared about losing our jobs or our health or about our children's futures, about getting old or wrestling with our addictions or afraid of the ways we sometimes feel pulled from our marriages or our commitments. It seems sometimes that our religion is built on a cultural foundation that values people being self-initiating Self-reliant, empowered, educated, and well-adjusted, all of which are fine things. The problem is that most people, including most of us, are more afraid than we let on. Afraid that a disease or an accident will strike our children down, or us. We're afraid of the consequences of terrorism and war of politicians and religious leaders who seem to devalue gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer lives, of a criminal justice system that devalues black and brown lives, or border guards who devalue immigrant lives, or people who devalue Muslim lives, or certain religions that devalue women's power and their reproductive freedom or corporations that debase the earth, or that turn everyone and everything into a means to a profit, or we're afraid that technology is robbing us of our humanity, or that we can't beat this depression, or survive another surgery, we're scared we'll be a burden to our children, 
or we'll lose our minds before our bodies, or our bodies before our minds. If coming to church means putting on a Sunday face and hiding all of this from one another and presenting a facade of self-reliance, well then, pardon me, Mr. Emerson, but who wants to go to that church? I realize that if coming to my congregation means pretending that you don't have any beliefs or longings that fit outside a particular middle-class progressive norm, then most people probably don't want to attend my church because that's not a free church. It's more like a spiritual and emotional closet. We need to have a coming out in this association. So that people know, that we know, that if you're poor or Christian or Republican or homeless or a felon or a veteran or whatever and whoever you are, you are embraced by a love beyond belief and you are a vessel of love beyond belief. Are you familiar with the original Cinderella story, not the Disney? version, but the original grim fairy tale? It's a grim fairy tale. <laughs> In it, when they come looking for the one who fits into the glass slipper, Cinderella's stepsisters each desperately try to fit in. The first one cuts off her toes, and the other one cuts off her heel to try to fit in. Imagine the pain of trying to stuff your bloody severed foot into a glass slipper. Right? It's painful to cut off parts of ourselves in order to try to fit in, whether it's a slipper or a church. And if we're not careful, that's what we can end up asking people to do. We say our churches are places where people can bring their whole selves, but I'm not convinced we're really there yet. But the good news is that this spiritual fire that we are the tenders of is a living tradition. I'm inspired by the story of Queen Esther from the Hebrew Scriptures. In it, we learn that the king of Persia catches a glance of Esther, a gorgeous and charming young Jewish girl who captures his heart. If you don't know the story, Esther is an orphan who's raised by her cousin Mordecai, who warns her not to mention to anyone that she's a Jew. Esther follows his advice and hides her truth and her religion and her ethnicity and is soon crowned queen of the empire. One day Mordecai raises the wrath of the king's corrupt chief officer Haman by refusing to bow down before him. Haman clearly has some anger management issues. Because in his fury, he convinces the king to let him announce a royal decree to kill all of the Jews in the empire. There was no Jewish Lives Matter campaign back then. There were no Unitarian Universalists yet willing to stand on the side of love for the Jews. Upon hearing about the decree, Mordecai tears his clothes and puts on sackcloth and ashes. Before long, Mordecai is standing at the gates of the palace telling one of the court eunuchs to let Esther know what's happening to the Jews. This is what I love about Bible stories. You just don't find stories like this anymore. Here we have what amounts to a Jewish gentleman standing around in a burlap sack covered with ashes hanging out in the center of town talking with a eunuch. But eunuchs matter too. I'll never forget at my colleague and classmate, Reverend Loria Font's ordination, when Dr. Ibrahim Farajaje, professor of Star King Theological School, used this same Bible story of Esther and made the point that in that cultural context, eunuchs were transgender folks who lived outside of the male-female binary of their times. And Dr. Farajaje used the story of these trans ancestors 
to remind us how throughout history there have always been folks who have transcended their culture's gender norms and who have also played very important roles in the work of, and salvation of society. In this story, the eunuch takes Mordecai's message to Esther, telling her that she must implore the king to intercede on the Jews' behalf. Esther tells the eunuch to relay back to Mordecai. If any person, even her, enters the royal presence in the inner court without first being summoned, there's but one law that applies. That person shall be put to death. And more importantly, Esther says, I have not been summoned to see the king for 30 days. In other words, she's worried that she may have fallen out of favor with the king and this would give him the perfect excuse to do away with her. Mordecai is not just asking her to serve on a committee or something. <laughs> He's asking her to put her life on the line for her religion and her people. But when Mordecai is told what Esther has said, he sends this reply. Do not imagine, Esther that because you are in the royal palace that you alone of all the Jews will escape. If you remain silent at such a time as this, relief and deliverance for the Jews will appear from another quarter, but you and your family will perish. Perhaps, he says, it is for just such a time as this that you have become queen. Esther heard the reply. And she found the courage to go talk to the king. She says, in defiance of the law, I shall go to the king. If I perish, I perish. And in the end, the Jews were saved because of Esther's courage. And her religion was saved because of her willingness to reveal her truth. And that's what you and I can and need to be doing more of. Being courageous and real with each other. Because... This is not just a story about a woman named Esther. It's a story about you. You are here for just such a time as this. I believe you and I are here and are uniquely called to this moment. And this moment is calling us to courageously throw our stories and our heartbreaks and our sacred truths as fuel onto the spiritual fire that we are tending on this earth. There's a lot of fuel in those closets we keep that's being wasted. We need to free each other to stop hiding. Now, I'm willing to bet you have something important about yourself that you are hesitant to tell people in your congregation, but that if you did tell, and you found that you were still loved and respected, it would be incredibly healing for you and would free others to do the same. Now that sounds like a church that I'd like to attend. A church where people do that. Right. A place where I can be held in love for who I really am. I'll confess something else. I spent five years of my ministry, the first five years, apologizing to God nearly every Sunday after church for the ways I failed again to show honestly, share honestly with my congregation how important prayer and my relationship to God is to me. And I was the minister. Yet many times even I was afraid to fully open up about my own walk with God. I've continually pushed myself to be courageous and honest with my congregation. I've now been there 15 years. This past year in a sermon I apologized to the white people in the church for the ways that I have not always been able to hold and minister to them very well in their struggles with the transitions that we've been going through as we become a more multiracial, multicultural congregation. Eventually it occurred to me that I'd had great training in seminary and since seminary teaching me how to be a white ally to people of color and a straight ally to the LGBTQ communities. 
but I've never received any training on how to be a white ally to white people who are struggling with the painful work of overcoming deeply ingrained ideas of white supremacy and privilege. Which is a significant part of the work of a parish minister in our association. That's been the hardest part of this change for me. When I see white members of my church who seem like they're resisting or not understanding that they need to do some work to unlearn racism, it can take me to some pretty hopeless places. Because if these progressive, open-minded, justice-centered, smart, wonderful people aren't willing to do what it takes, then I wonder who will. In those moments, I fear that my church members might not be good enough. And worse, I feel that I may not be a good enough leader to get us where we need to go. But then when I finally admitted my fears and this struggle with my congregation, instead of trying to act like I had it all figured out, it shifted everything. It allowed others to talk more freely about their fears and their mistakes and what they were struggling with. And more and more of us stopped hiding from one another. What I've learned is that the more real I can be in the pulpit or in the board meetings, then the more trust forms and the warmer it feels at the fireside of our common endeavor. So I've begun to teach and preach from my mistakes rather than always talking about my successes. And it's made a huge positive difference. Each of us needs to find the courage to be real about telling our truth. And ministers, we need to lead the way. And many of you who've gone before me have shown me the way. I'm just a slow learner with layers of ego that I'm still trying to peel off. But I see something in this new generation of young ministers that seems almost hardwired for authenticity. And I think that is a really good sign of hope. Because I believe you and I are here for just such a time as this. And it matters because what we're about, this covenanted free faith, is an extraordinary contribution to religious life in America. In fact, it's a remarkable development in the history of human culture. I don't think America can ever be the country it can and must be if Unitarian Universalism does not become what it can and must be. And I don't think that humanity will ever become what it needs to be for justice to prevail until we or some other group achieves the promise that this living tradition offers. So while we've designed an entire conference this year on the idea of discovering the new way, I want to propose that it's not a new way that we have to live into. It's that we have to finally embody the fullness of the proposition, which is the old way. We have yet to fully embrace the promise of our democratic covenantal tradition. Langston Hughes has that incredible poem I just read, Let America Be America Again, in which he describes the ideals of our country, and he says, that's never been America to me. Let America be America again the America that never was but still can be. I feel that way about Unitarian Universalism. Let's let, let's let Unitarian Universalism be Unitarian Universalism again. The faith it never was yet and yet can be. Let Unitarian Universalism be the tradition it never has been yet must become a faith for the free. Not a faith for a small sliver of the mostly white, middle class, NPR listening audience. Not that I have any problem with that audience. 
but a true faith for the free, all of us, of every color, culture, country, and kind. We've never been that free. But let us pledge tonight that Unitarian Universalism soon will be. We can and must redeem this faith, not by changing it, but by living into it in a way that we never have been able to before, but we can now. Ministers being fellowshiped tonight and others being credentialed, leaders and members of congregations who are here and those who are listening to these words. Imagine that you have been put here among us for just such a time as this and that you and your courageous truth is what is needed to save our religion and our people. I said tonight I want to see if we can find that meeting place where, where our broken hearts and our humanity can come together and bathe in the tender understanding of love's possibilities so that we will make sure this living tradition, this important fire we tend, will never be put out. Throw your truth, your heartbreak, your fears and longings onto the pyre, and let's build it and build it until the flames are like tongues that touch people of every language with a healing grace and a love beyond belief. Be blessed and be a blessing. I love you. Amen.